I'd like to thank you all so much for being here. And I've done this presentation uh, when, when I first had the book come out, I had a, a group ask me to do a talk. And I was so thrilled that there's that many groups around Los Angeles that love our history. And um, I'm, I'm so pleased to be here with you and the uh, uh, history of Los Angeles, because I've felt since I was a young kid, when I was watching Bunker Hill uh, houses being torn down, that we tear down too much and our history keeps leaving us too quickly before we can record it. So that was one reason why I put the book together. But uh, like Leonard said, I, um, let's see if this is going this way. Um, I was uh, the pastry chef for the Walt Disney Company for 10 years, and uh, I didn't have gray hair back then. And uh, I created a lot of iconic uh, uh, foods out there that people still are eating, like the corn dogs at the Red Wagon and Rice crispy Treat things and all sorts of things. And then um, one of my most uh, interesting jobs I did was food prep prop for the Golden Girls. So I recently was put into a... Uh, oh, uh, what do you call it, a, a trivia contest. And uh, they asked who the person that uh, did the cheesecakes was, and that was myself for the eight years. And uh, down below is um, a friend of mine that uh, I met through this book, and uh, we're in uh, the former house of Mae West and uh, Kimberly Beale Schmidt. Um, and I always bring a cheesecake when I'm over at uh, Mae's house. And then I do food tours of Europe, and uh, that's one of my... Uh, chateaus that we use and there's one of the ships i was on all the ships for uh eight years and uh two years ago was my, my last time so it was pre-covid and uh, like leonard said 118 countries and every continent in fact i was down at palmer station uh about 10 years ago i think it was now so Morning television changed for me um, on the one side with my cameraman that's uh, doing my live remotes. One of my first jobs was Mike and Maddie on ABC and uh, Home and Family just wrapped for uh, after nine years that I did uh, the food segment. So I like seeing these comparing of these two because you can kind of see um, my hair change. That's about it. I still smile. So there's that. And here we go with our book. I'm going to go into a little bit of detail on how um, the book is put together. It's a coffee table book. And we have um, in each location has a chapter. And this is the chapter heading for CC Browns. I wanted to highlight a lot of different things. I wanted to, um, uh, all of you, I want you to realize that this isn't just California that this book has been around. Even in New York, I tested things out there before I wrote the book. Uh, in some cities and states, they don't have strange phone numbers like we did. Uh, we had, uh, you know, uh, if you remember anything from the, all the way from the 60s, I guess it was, we had the first letters and Hollywood was H-O. Um, and I have in the title sheets, the name, the years it was opened, when it closed, the very first location where it was at, the phone number, the cuisine, who designed the building, because I love architecture and I tried to do a lot of uh, architecture in the book also, so it would uh, appeal to another audience. And then we have our building style, our what is there currently, and uh, maybe the location is still there. Some locations are not. So that's what we did with that. And uh, C.C. Brown's with its neon sign. This was on the back cover of the book. And this was one of my favorite, favorite places to go to. And uh, I dragged my mom everywhere. And uh, when people asked me when I started working on the book, it was um, probably in the 60s and 70s when I started going to these places because it stayed in my mind all these places. C.C. Brown's... Um, those of you that aren't from California or know of C.C. Uh, Brown's, Hot Fudge Sundays were invented there. And um, it was a great place because they would serve it correctly. The uh, fudge sauce would be in a little pitcher and you'd pour it into the silver goblet that had been frozen already with the ice cream. You can still get a likeness at um, one of the other locations in my book, uh, the Tam O'Shanter and 
uh, the Lowry's and Lowry's owns the, uh, the rights to CC Browns. And years back, I asked Lowry's what besides selling the fudge sauce in jars like this, were they going to do with the, the rights? And they, they thought that they would open up little tiny CC Brown stores around. They did try one for a short time close to Hollywood or Sunset and Vine, but uh, yeah, they still own the rights. So when I heard I was working on the book, I tried to get to these locations before they tore them down. And here is the inside a couple weeks before. It was a clothing store. There is the flocked wallpaper left in one of the um, light fixtures. The flocked wallpaper, I dragged my, uh, my nephew here and uh, I really was excited when the book came out. I had put the, given this book, picked this picture over to the el illustrator and she used this in the background. So it's in the background of the CC Brown um, sheet. Today, um, well, this is right when the book was, I was working on the book, it became a, uh, a little uh, junkie store of Hollywood Boulevard. Today, it's a Marshalls. And um, it's uh, kind of sad, but that's what it is. We've got uh, four locations I'll talk about a little bit. CC Brown's I just did. And uh, we have the Cock and Bull. And we have Spago's in the, the lower corner. That was the original Spago's uh, West Hollywood on Horn. And then we have the Brown Derby that's on the cover. These four items, four places created, um, invented some Los Angeles foods. C.C. Brown's Hot Fudge Sunday, the Cock and Bull 1948 was the Moscow Mule Drink. Um, that became popular about five years ago, eight years ago again when um, uh, Oprah Winfrey and her best friend Gail went to the uh, Yosemite and started making them when they were camping. And they thought, everybody thought the uh, Moscow Mule was invented by then. But um, the Cock and Bull uh, would have the mugs with the name of the star. So they hung on the, the bar uh, rafter. And then we have the Brown Derby, which is the Cobb salad. And the Cobb salad in my book, the book does have recipes in it. And um, the original Cobb salad would have a table side manor. The uh, waiter would come over and the tray would have rows of the different ingredients and would ask you what you wanted in it and then toss it. It wasn't uh, in the mounds of uh, ingredients that they are today when you see them places. And then Spago's was really the place for designer pizza and the open uh, kitchen plan that his uh, former wife, uh, Barbara Lazaroff, put together. So then we have, uh, staying on uh, Sunset, we have Schwab's Pharmacy, and this was the original look of it. And uh, Schwab's was a, a fascinating place. Um, you hear about it a lot, but um, I want to show, look how great that place looks. You know, well, it's a little busy that night. And um, today, it's this building section. Um, eight, uh, it's called 8,000 Sunset. Not Everything's gone in and out of this place. I mean, they had a, a grocery store for a while, a gym. Um, I think the movies are still there when they reopen. Um, I see the Trader Joe's is there. This is where um, uh, the record store was for a while. Um, but uh, that's uh, kind of what I like to show what's there now. This isn't shown in the book, only in my presentation. I like people back east to see what's going on. So um, there's uh, what Schwab's is today. And then we have one of the most beautiful built, no, there's the inside of Schwab's. And um, I love doing, if you look down in the dead center lower, you see the milk sitting out and um, it was a, a, a counter to eat. The one lady standing behind looks a little mad because they're taking too long. And um, the waiter, uh, the, the wait staff, they, ingredients you don't see um, health standards like you do today. So uh, there's uh, where Schwab's. And uh, this is uh, one of the most beautiful buildings that's gone, tiny nailers. And uh, I love to talk about this place because uh, 
uh, it's where my parents had their first date after they had gone somewhere else. So this is where you went for breakfast. And it was a place to be seen also. If um, the next picture was uh, a 1953 photo spread with uh, Bobby Driscoll, and he also did the voice of Peter Pan, and uh, we have Natalie Wood. And they followed these two young love interests around town for uh, teens on the town in photo play magazine. And uh, they went to Wallach's Music City, if you remember that place, and then you see them uh, at the drive-in. So today, it's kind of sad. That's what the corner looks like today. Um, not a whole lot there, uh, except a strip mall that uh, it's the most famous part of uh, the strip mall is a, a chicken restaurant and it was one of the first places the Brad Pitt worked when he came to town in a chicken suit standing on the corner directing traffic trying to get them to buy the chicken and uh, so if you ever go past there and you see some guy in a chicken outfit think it could be the future uh, Brad Pitt so be nice to them and honk and wave. Our next is uh, one of my favorite places to go to, and it is uh, Musso and Frank's Grill that is still in operation. In fact, what's exciting is tonight they reopen after COVID, and if you've never, ever been to Frank and Musso's, I want you to go, but you need to enter through the back parking lot. That's the correct way. You park your car back there, and you walk through the back, and then you walk through the restaurant to see who's there, and uh, they had their 100th birthday a couple years ago, and I was invited to it, and um, I've written about them uh, many times. It's a beautiful uh, place. Uh, those of you that are from back east that have never seen it, um, it was um, also in the recent uh, Quentin Tarantino film, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, and uh, that was the uh, table, and there's friends. The restaurant is never that empty. We, if you want it to be empty, you get there right when they open at 11 o'clock. And we were having lunch before we were going to the Hollywood Bowl that day. So some friends from uh, Ohio and Chicago. And uh, there's uh, the back uh, entrance. You should go in there. And there's uh, two of the stars from uh, the uh, movie. And then we have um, another place. We've got uh, Clifton's Cafeteria. This one... Um, it closed down during uh, while my book was in uh, working uh, while I was working on the book to where I had it down as being closed and not reopened. It's been reopened and reclosed and it's back reopened. Um, it uh, was purchased by another company. There's a, a great book on Clifton's just on it uh, by itself, but uh, there's what uh, Clifton's looks like today when you go by with the neon, which is really nice. It's more of a nightclub now when uh, COVID is uh, gone. So we're going to talk pre-COVID a lot. So then we have the beautiful Formosa Cafe. This was also closed when I first uh, came out with the book and we had to redo it. Um, we had to add that it had been reopened. Um, if you aren't familiar with the 1933 group, they own a number of locations around the South uh, land area. And uh, right now they're working on the pup um, uh, uh, building for hot dogs. And it is one of uh, the most interesting places to go. I went through the Formosa before they did the redo and then after, and it's right on Formosa and Santa Monica. And a lot of stars went there and they also have eight by tens all over the place. So uh, the 1933 group redid the building inside and turned it back to beyond what anybody would think. So it's just beautiful. And uh, they have an outdoor upstairs outside you can go to. And uh, there's uh, daytime and the bar. And it's just, it's Hollywood. You take somebody to the uh, Musso and Frank's uh, for dinner or um, Formosa for cocktails beforehand. Uh, you could do two nights, one in each. So there's an opening night with uh, Kimberly again and uh, a group of uh, friends and Alison Bartino that's part of uh, Vintage LA. And uh, then you have DJ Rodney from uh, Sunset. So that was opening night. Ac across from um, 
the uh, Musa and Frank's on, on Hollywood Boulevard is the last uh, Pig and Whistle. It was redone. So that's another place that I'm glad that got redone. It's right next to the, uh, the theater, the um, Egyptian, the historical Egyptian. And uh, I was excited to do a talk on this slideshow there for the uh, Art Deco Society. And back in the day, um, you didn't have concession stands. You had a restaurant close by that would have a side door and the Pig and Whistle still has the side door. The Pig and Whistle now is nothing like it was back in the day, but the inside is really nice. So it, uh, it is great to go see uh, the Pig and Whistle. It, I would say, um, the menu is just regular food. They have in the, the far back, they have a comedy club for late at night. And there it is today. And uh, they've uh, redone it. And the ceiling is beautiful. It's, it's very old California look. So that's on Hollywood Boulevard. You can kind of see on the one side of the foyer court of the theater. Then we have um, the most famous, the Brown Derby. Whenever I would talk across the country about this book before I did it, the first thing people would say is, are you going to put the Brown Derby in? And I made sure, um, of course, that was what started the book because I had a, I purchased a book, I'm looking at my bookshelf, I, I purchased a cookbook, an old uh, uh, historical uh, cookbook of the Brown Derby. And I was going through that and doing classes on Brown Derby food. And everybody knows about the Brown Derby. So I was really pleased when my publisher put that on the cover. Uh, when you write a book, you don't have a lot of say on what the cover looks like with some publishers, but this publisher was really excited about putting the Brown Derby on the cover. There's the inside. And uh, it was a place for lunch, simple food, uh, very good. I think I have paprika chicken in my book and um, a biscuit recipe. And uh, then we have um, uh, one of my favorite is with uh, um, Lucy and Desi in uh, the Brown Derby. When I was working on the book and I did a talk, they had um, a collector of Brown Derby um, items, which I didn't realize there was so much. And the collector was there with his collection. So I got to see a lot of interesting things. Here is the inside of the Brown Derby. And uh, what is kind of sad is some people feel that it was saved. It was moved once uh, because a high rise was being placed in it. But today, the Brown Derby is shoved in the corner of a strip mall called the Brown Derby Plaza. And there it is. And um, it uh, was cut a little bit. And I haven't been inside of it. Um, this is across the street from the Ambassador Hotel where it stood, and that is in the book also. It's, uh, I know we have to have change, but uh, if all restaurants, I get the question asked, and uh, so does um, Bobby from the 1933 group, what restaurant would he bring back? And it would be the Brown Derby. There is a Brown Derby in Florida um, that is a reenactment at uh, Walt Disney World. So there we have Scandia. This was uh, on uh, Sunset. Uh, this is where I kind of am upset over what happened to this building because it could have been saved. Um, today, uh, well, here's what it looked like for a while there. And it is... Um, it was raining that day. I got out there and got some pictures. Let me back up that picture. Um, if you look where the word Scandia is, uh, down those the dark corridor, that's how the stars would go in. They would go upstairs. The maitre d' was the star of the restaurant, not the chef like it is today. The maitre d' without computers would know when you came in if you were allergic to something because you told them the time before or the waiter heard about it or you couldn't have onions or something like that. Garlic wasn't your favorite. So he would make mental note and know, and I say he because 99% it was a, a male. And uh, Scandia was one of the perfect places for them to know exactly what you ate and what you didn't like. So Scandia had a great wine cellar. 
there it, it turned into offices for a while, a nice mid-century building. And then it's boarded up when I was out there. And then after it was boarded up, it was torn down and uh, it became a hotel. And the hotel uh, it was being built. And the Conservancy, I believe it was a Conservancy um, or maybe West Hollywood group uh, of Conservancy, uh, proposed putting this building as the front part of the hotel, but knocking it down was easier in their eyes. But my eyes, you know, save it, you'd still have a little bit of it. So next we have um, uh, Paul Williams. Paul Williams is um, one of the best architects of Los Angeles, and he is on the um, uh, the right hand side and he's working on plans uh, for Perinos. He also uh, worked on the Ambassador Hotel and the Zebra Room. He uh, is working with Mr. Perino there and it's uh, Perinos was on Wilshire. I highlight uh, Paul Williams. Um, there's been so many different uh, books recently and talks on Paul Williams, the architect, to where you should go to the LA Conservancy and see all of the uh, information that they do have and self tours of Paul Williams buildings. So we have our first one that I was Perino's. Perino's was on uh, Wilshire and you can see the beautiful front regalness of the building and the neon sign that says Perino's off to the side and the beautiful inside, very elegant. Uh, when this was closed, uh, the, one of the best movies to see that was filmed here was uh, probably uh, Mommy Dearest because uh, it was a, a great location to film. Um, here is um, some of the stars that would go. What was interesting is I was doing this talk down in San Diego University at the History uh, Group and uh, I mentioned who these people were and uh, I said, uh, we've got uh, Joe DiMaggio and Bob Hope and Marilyn Monroe. And somebody asked me who they were. They didn't, had never heard of those three people. So um, I was a little surprised. So hopefully all of you know who these people are. Now is Perino's today. That sign that was outside is in the lobby of a condo unit uh, that they built. And there's the outside. Uh, it's uh, kind of not even close. So they saved the sign. That was about it. So there's Chasen's. This is another Paul Williams uh, building. In the, the book, I have um, recipes and the most requested is chili. Why, did, why didn't I put Chasen's chili in it? Or did I put Chasen's chili in it? And when I was researching, I found over 20 variations of the Chasen's chili. And I uh, tried to be as uh, honest as possible. And I wasn't going to put all, and everybody's aunt, uncle has the recipe on a napkin. So I did not include Chasen's chili in the recipe. But uh, they had booths. And every certain night, if you were somebody, you had your own booth. So here's uh, Jimmy Stewart, and he always had the same booth on a certain night. So when they dis dismantled the, the location, uh, the booth was sent to Jimmy Stewart's library. I guess he thought he was a, a, a museum. And uh, it is in Indiana, Pennsylvania. And Ronald Reagan's he had a booth there, and his is at the library in Simi Valley, the presidential library. It's where he proposed to uh, Nancy Reagan. So there we have Chasen's today, which is a Bristol Farms store. I'm going to back up so you can see the front of the, whoop, too fast. And I don't think it looks anything close to what it did back then. So it looks like the building was, it's painted white. That's about it. So, um, uh, well, there you go. There's Ambassador Hotel. And uh, this is an interesting uh, project that uh, hit, uh, it was a place 
to go. It, uh, I dragged my mom there. I remember when they were auctioning off things and uh, all I wanted to do was really go down to the kitchen area because I had heard um, that the kitchen was still pretty much in place, but they were auctioning pretty much everything. And um, it is gone. And there was the Coconut Grove. The Coconut Grove was a very uh, popular place. And they, uh, a lot of stars would go there. If you didn't go to the Coconut Grove, you went across the street and down the, uh, a ways, uh, was to the Zebra Room, which was the, this building is still there. Uh, it's uh, housing now, but this is off of Lafayette Park in Wilshire. And uh, the Zebra Room, that was redone by uh, Williams also. This used to be a Hilton Hotel. And then it became a Sheraton townhouse, it was called. And that is where uh, the uh, famous uh, Elizabeth Taylor and Nikki Hilton had their wedding. And uh, there's the front of the zebra room. And you can just see that regalness that uh, Paul Williams would do. And there's the inside. And that was from a postcard. And then we have uh, Ciro's Nightclub. And this building is still there on uh, Hollywood Boulevard. There's the inside, uh, the long tables, very um, show type. I'm, I'm on the stage looking uh, straight out into the group. You saw the long tables and then the banquettes at the back. And there's another group of, uh, we have Betty Grable, we have Lucille Ball with her head turned. And uh, the lady looking a little shocked is um, the uh, um, Luella Parsons. So I would explain to kids uh, when I do a, a youth group of this t uh, travel uh, tour. Uh, she's the TMZ of the day. So uh, somebody said, you mean she sat with the stars and she didn't run around? Well, yes, that's, they wanted to know uh, Luella Parsons was close by and she would uh, write stories. So, and interesting. Then we have Sarah's also the arranged date of uh, Phyllis Wagner and Rock Hudson. Studios made you go out to be seen and they really wanted you to be seen. So you uh, would have Luella Parsons talk about you. So then we also have today, it's the comedy store. Uh, I should have shot a picture from the original spot like I did before, but there's the comedy store that is there. And then we have the Palladium, and this is where my parents went on their first date before they went to the drive-in afterwards. And the Palladium is still there, which is great. Uh, they don't just serve food there anymore. They used to serve, you would go um, to dinner, and there it is. It would be one of the largest uh, places to dance, 7,500 for dancing and 5,000 for, or four, 5,000 for dinner. They had a simple menu of two items. You could have uh, spaghetti and meatballs or a ham dish. And uh, normally would be the two uh, items. And you got the dancing and everything at the same price. And then somebody would walk around and take your picture. The other place that was a little bit lower in cost and was a little bit, uh, I'm trying to think of a nice word, people would say mm, grittier, was Florentine Gardens. This building is still there yeah, on Hollywood Boulevard. It's down closer to the freeway. And um, I don't have a picture of it today, but it doesn't look as regal as it does there. They also did the all package deal. You ate and uh, danced and listen to a, a group and stuff. They did burlesque here a little bit. So there was uh, that, the Florentine Gardens. Then we already talked about the Cock and Bull. They did uh, the Moscow Mule and a Sunday brunch. There it is today. It's a Jaguar dealership. If you uh, walk, uh, this is on Doheny and Sunset. If you go if you can see that circular pie cut window, underneath that is a, uh, a plaque that talks about the cock and bull. So um, it kind of, it doesn't look like the same thing. They, they might have, I'm trying to uh, see, what I do is I count windows up above. You've got one, two, three, four, five. Uh, you kind of have those. So then we have the Bullocks Wilshire, which uh, just had a birthday. And it is a... Uh, 
uh, a department store, those of you from outside of Los Angeles. The building is still there, which is phenomenal. They do tours. Make sure you get on their mailing list so you can have tea there once a year. And it's uh, 92 years old. It's today, it's the Southwestern Law School, but a lot of the uh, intact area is still there. And there it is today. And it is just so regal. And I was there for the 90th uh, birthday party. And there it is. Uh, one side is the tea room uh, before and today. And the, it's not open to the public. Uh, it's the uh, student's cafeteria, you could say. But they do open it with original menu items from um, the day that it would be open. It, uh, this. Uh, place was a phenomenal place. They would um, have no cash registers. They had different verbiage for things. They, uh, they had mannequins um, that were live. They didn't have the mannequins like we know today at Macy's, but uh, Bullock's Wilshire was a beautiful, beautiful place. We have Michelli's Pizza. This is not what it looks like today, but it is still in operation. It's uh, around the corner from the, the Pig and Whistle. The Pig and Whistle is part of this uh, pizza joint, I call it, but it's really a restaurant, Michelli's. If you go inside and you sit at one of the booths, look at the booths on the left hand, on the edges, it'll have the little Pig and Whistle. The Pig and Whistle uh, sold all their uh, uh, booths and Michelli's bought it. When I was working on the book, I couldn't get a recipe from Michelli's. I didn't get a whole lot of from things from Michelli's, but I did... Uh, uh, get some answers and they afterwards they saw their chapter and they said it was good enough so I uh, created a recipe for one of the I think a cheese bread toast that I did for them so and there it is today and it's still going um, just like COVID they had a little bit of uh, uh, closure but I suggest if you go there, the Beatles ate there before they went over to the Hollywood Bowl to play back in the 60s. And it, it's really a great place. Uh, the wait staff sings uh, opera sometimes and the food's really good. So, and there is, uh, this is a picture. This originally, I believe is the, one of their other locations, not the one we just did, but if it looks familiar, it is where they taught Lucy to throw pizza for the I Love Lucy show. So she uh, did that and it sees candy, the ice, uh, the candy. So Mommy's Own Restaurant, um, this uh, was where Wolfgang Puck, Puck started with uh, Patrick Terrell. I, uh, w working on the book, I wanted the uh, pictures of the Hockney pictures of, um, their menus for the book and I didn't have the rights to them, but we uh, got him to give them to us, Patrick on the, you know, in the suit. This is the parking lot. It wasn't that exciting of a looking restaurant. Um, I did some internship here. It was a Rolls Royce dealership is what they called it. Um, and there is Patrick Terrell with Orson Welles and Orson Welles would have his booth on Thursdays, I believe it was for lunch uh, all the time. And these are the Hockney uh, menus that are in my book because we really, I wanted that colorful look. Um, and the only way to do it was to get Patrick Terrell to agree, so he did. There it is today we sh of uh, Spago's where Wolfgang Puck left and went there and started his designer pizzas. This location stayed open at the same time Beverly Hills stayed open for a while. Beverly Hills is open now. And uh, this was the inside. Not too exciting if you look at the chairs. It was. It looked like um, the furniture looked like patio furniture. And this was the main dining room. The best part of this is the food, being able to watch it. And if you look at those floral displays were big and live. And uh, those were the doors you'd come in. And right where Wolfgang Puck's head is, was uh, the bar area and the most beautiful flower displays. And again, this was a place where people would go certain nights and they'd have their own tables. The farce, uh, the gentleman standing by himself, that whole bank on that side is the windows that you see here uh, going across the ribbon of windows. And you could see all of Los Angeles from there and all the way from downtown to Century City. Those are familiar with the area. 
and uh, that is what it looked like. My last uh, picture is uh, who I dedicated my book to, and it was my mom, or is my mom, and there she is when uh, she was a car hop at Marty's Drive-In, and mom and I at the beach recently. So uh, somebody recently said, oh, is your mother no longer with us because you dedicated it? And just because you dedicated doesn't mean they aren't with you anymore. And uh, my next book is coming out in a couple uh, weeks or a couple months, August 10th, I believe. And it's called Made in California, the California born burger joints, diners, fast foods, restaurants that changed America and everything from uh, In-N-Out Burger, Randy's Donuts, uh, Seize Candy has a big uh, presence because it's their 100th birthday this year, and that'll be uh, coming out in August. And there's my website. I know some of you have questions. We'll get to those. And you also have um, an email. Um, those of you that are interested in autographed copies of the book, let me know. And there is my presentation. So we'll go to question and answers. I know some of you will have comments and I've talked about this uh, a lot. People will say why you didn't include X or Z or whatever. It may be in my next book. Oh, by the way, before I for forget is um, just today and you're the first to know, I am announcing that uh, my book after Made in California, the following book will be LA Legendary Restaurants Volume 2. It won't have as much star power, but it will have some star uh, mentions, and that'll be another uh, coffee table book and large book. So uh, that uh, I, I kind of tricked announced it last night, but I didn't say what it was, but uh, we will be doing a, a second volume, and I'm looking forward to it because we'll be adding some of the things that people have asked for. So let's go with uh, Candice. Uh, Moose and Frank's is awesome, one of my favorites. I hope it's with, um, it, it, it will withstand the pandemic. Um, the management there took care of the, uh, the staff and um, uh, that is uh, correct. Um, the next one, is, oh, oh, there we go. Um, the, the next one is a, uh, yeah, oh boy, yeah. Um, Tex, um, T-A-I-X, it's a, a, the oldest French restaurant. Now this is where uh, we get into some controversy. Um, it just said that somebody said, um, uh, Candace again, she said, it's another great one that has bitten the dust just recently, correct? Um, as far as I know, uh, it too, they, the family sold the property. And um, now the LA Conservancy is in court trying to get them with the sale of the property is what I've understood is they will open up a small restaurant at the base. And if you're from Los Angeles, you've seen the a lot of the um, uh, five-story buildings with little stores underneath. And that's what it looked like it was going to be. Now, I have to look at if I own the property and I didn't want to keep being in the restaurant business and I couldn't sell it, but somebody wanted to buy my property for 10 million, what would I do? You know, it, it, you want to save these things, but it's difficult. That's why the 1933 group, they're very smart in what they do save and help. So it, the building's still there and uh, it is listed in my book. And in fact, they were selling it in their gift store for a while. Okay, anonymous. Um, oh, I just skipped one because, uh, but I'll go to this one. Why no mention of Jacks at the beach? Um, some places weren't mentioned because I couldn't get too much information on it. But I did an infomercial at Jacks at the beach. Come to think of it, and I should have probably put a lot of the car hop places my mom worked at because she worked at a lot of them over in uh, the the beach area and Santa Monica. So I probably will uh, look into that. Um, then uh, uh, somebody, uh, Candace again said uh, a few times when Southwest opened up the tea room. So at Bullock's, she's enjoyed the tour. What you should do is get on the Friends of Bullock's website and become part of their, their mailing list. Make a small donation and they will give you access to tickets to be able to purchase 
when I was working on the book, I hadn't been in the building since 94 when they closed it. So I was able to get uh, access two years later uh, by getting on the mailing list and it was a lottery. Uh, Google, um, and you'll probably, they are doing more tours of the location on the weekends. So um, what do I think of the Academy Museum changes to the May Company building? Well, I look at uh, things like that. Uh, we won't be, there isn't a food related to that question, but the May Company building, I think it's going to be beautiful. Uh, I worry about the place across the street, the diner across the street, they just use for uh, pretty much filming. That's what happens here in Southern California. If they don't tear down the place, they becomes a filming location. So I, uh, I'm glad they did that. Uh, I think they're putting it back to the original look, which is nice. So any comments about Edna Earl's fog cutter? Mm, no, come to think of it. Um, I gotta make a comment since you asked a question. Uh, I'm trying to think because I started with about 120 locations and cut it down to 45. So maybe it will be um, uh, something else, you know. So what's the Brown Derby in Monrovia? Well, it would, this wasn't one of the original Brown Derbies because the original, there was one um, uh, on Sunset, no, Wilshire, Beverly Hills. Um, there was uh, Wilshire, the original one you saw, one in Hollywood off of Vine, and there was one in Las Feliz. So Monrovia, I don't know uh, what that's about. There is a place called the Derby that is not the Brown Derby, and that is still in operation. That will be in the next book. So, um, oh, I mentioned my personal book library, and can I share a few of the historical books on hand? Oh. I have a big section of historical cookbooks. Um, oh, I'm trying to think, I'm looking right now. Um, even the Musso and Frank Grill cookbook that came out recently uh, for their 100th anniversary is great. Um, I've got, uh, I love the LA Times um, food section cookbooks that have come out over the years. I wish they'd come out with another one. Um, some hotel ones from New York. I have those. Um, trying to think if I've got some. I like when a restaurant comes out with a cookbook from the 80s, 80s and earlier, because after that, uh, it started seeming like they would just uh, come out with a book to try to sell it. And it's difficult to use some of those recipes. So, um, uh, uh, Blarney's Castle comes to mind. Um, then we have, um, I don't have a question on that one. It's just uh, a statement, I think. Um, all right, anonymous attendee. I love this anonymous person. I Hopefully it's the same one. Who was the inventor of the French dip, Coles or Felipe's? Now, what's interesting is I didn't put either one of those in this book, but they will be in the next book if they both uh, are very uh, helpful. Um, I have the question better, which do you enjoy better, the Coles French dip or the Felipe's? Those of you outside of the Los Angeles area, it's two restaurants, um, both that I've been to many times, Felipe's more than the other. And they both are, it's a fighting war. It's similar to the uh, meat, uh, the, oh, the sandwiches over in Philly, Philly steak sandwiches. So that's, uh, my favorite of the two is um, the one I'm dining in at the time. <laughs> That's a nice way of putting it in case they become a sponsor. But uh, I gave you a hint, I'm at one more than the other. Uh, where can you get the book? Yeah, all the regular places, but if you would like uh, autographed copies, I do have some that I can ship out. So yeah, my email is in the, the story and things like that. So I can do that. Um, uh, oh, okay. Um, now we have Linda. Uh, she uh, loved the before and after, and uh, she didn't know the Brown Derby shell was still partially intact. Yes, it is. And I really, I think uh, um, Bobby over at uh, 1933 Group, if she he redid it, he would take that apart and put it together because that's the kind of guy he is. Um, 
let's see. Uh, how was the restaurant scene in the LA in the early 20th century? Does it really, oh, the LA scene of restaurants unique from other cities, um, San Francisco was the first large city and I have had requests of doing a book for that city and their history. But since I didn't live there, I, I stuck with the Los Angeles thing. But uh, LA, I mean, we have some old locations and we've lost some over COVID also, like the Pacific Dining Car, which I'll highlight in the next book. So there's uh, the, the answer to that is uh, San Francisco has a lot larger dining scene without the star factor. So um, then we have um, an old LA restaurant website. Was there familiar? Yes, uh, Gabriel, I was. And um, I don't, the last time I looked, which was a couple years ago, at the time when I looked at that website, oldrestaurants.com, there was a lot of um, restaurants still located, listed that were gone and uh, it wasn't updated. So that's all I, I know about that. Uh, Candice, uh, thank you, George. Thank you, Candice, for uh, being here. And um, then we have uh, Rita. Um, have I included Jeannie and Mar oh, the, uh, our Marcel's French Cafe on Whittier Boulevard in uh, Montebello? Um, I haven't finalized my whole list yet, so um, I will have that down. Are you going to check the chat area? Um, I think people were using the chat as a chat. There's a lot of back and forth banter, um, so I wouldn't want to try to read all of it, but oh. someone did ask what was your favorite restaurant? And someone else asked, what was your favorite recipe from your books? Oh, um, I some restaurants I didn't go to because I, I wasn't of age when they were in operation and or I couldn't afford it. Um, but I taught my nephew that you can go to any restaurant if you call them or you can do a, a, a reservation later in the evening and, and just go for dessert because dessert prices are a lot cheaper, you know. Or, or an appetizer. But my favorite, uh, I still, uh, Musso and Frank's is still one of my favorites uh, of feeling like old Hollywood. And their favorite recipe in the book is uh, uh, home me, and it would be the uh, Cantonese chicken salad recipe from Bullock's Wilshire. And what I think is fascinating is there were ingredients in that that no one could find at the grocery store back in the day. Today we have it, but um, it was uh, soy sauce. You couldn't find that at the regular grocery store in the 60s and 70s, a regular plain old grocery store. And, uh, but it, it is one of my favorite uh, uh, recipes because I'll make it and uh, people will think it reminds them of something they've tasted, but they aren't sure. So that would be it, yeah. Thank you. And uh, did you have another question? Oh, there's a lot of comments. Uh, someone asked about Sano's in Los Feliz. Hmm, I'm not familiar with that one. I wanna, um, Celeste, that uh, is a good friend, she just did the website for the Bullock's Wilshire campus um, support. So uh, if through the Southwestern uh, Law Library, uh, you can get it through there also, but uh, there is the link directly to become a member of Friends of Bullock's Wilshire. And I suggest everyone to, we even had a, uh, the Art Deco Society of Los Angeles had a, uh, a number of times, um, a day of um, uh, fashion. And they had beautiful fashions from back when Bullock's Wilshire was around. And they had a fashion show and they had old cars out front. And you really felt like you you stepped back in time. It was beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. All yeah. right. A, a few people have looked up the Brown Derby in Montebello and Arcadia area. And uh, uh, Desiree just said, yes, it is the Brown, the Derby in Arcadia, not the Brown Derby. And I thought that too back in the day. Uh, Michael has Barney's Beanery. Is that going to be in there? Um, I have that listed as. Uh, uh, um, yes, I have it listed. 
as um, for the next book. Um, is it pronounced Philippe? Philips? Philips? Um, Philippe? Philippe A's. And um, <laughs> I love reading some of the, these uh, 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 question and answers. Um, it, it's uh, Philippe's, quickly, Philippe's. So um, the next one is uh, somebody says Coles has a major attitude problem. Now, the difference between Coles and Felipe's that if, if you haven't um, been there in either one, uh, I'm going to talk pre-COVID. You would stand in line and uh, get your sandwich made by a carver. And uh, you'd stand in these straight lines through the tables. Then you'd go find yourself a table. Kohl's has um, a bar. They uh, have weight service. That's a little bit different. So, but I, I do, uh, I, Felipe's, it's just uh, more home feeling. I've been there forever. Um, let's see. Um, okay, we answered my favorite uh, recipe. And uh, cock and bull, um, the, uh, yes, that recipe is in the cock and bull um, site, uh, the cheese rarebit. Um, what are my thoughts on Clifton's renovation? Um, I haven't been inside. I really, uh, yes, I have come to think of it right when they reopened as the cafeteria. I think when you upscaled the place, they, they went into having a chef that quit after a couple of weeks. Um, high uh, bringing the prices so high um not having green jello anymore <laughs> so uh and and having designer pastry they went for a different clientele and before it was they had a, a, a at clifton's it was pay what you can and they would feed anybody and then they opened up um more of a soup kitchen later on so um it's it just, uh, it's sad, but uh, Monty's is in the new book. Yes, so far. Mr. Tim Miller. Now, Tim Miller, he does photography for me once in a while. And um, if it's the same Tim Miller, and uh, it does say uh, he wanted to know if Hamburger Hamlet or The Good Earth will be in the next book. Hamburger Hamlet um, is in the this book. So obviously you haven't read it, Tim. And uh, the, um, uh, Marilyn Lewis, uh, she wrote a book uh, on the history of Hamburger Hamlet with a few recipes. That's another book I, I researched. I, I, re I read every restaurant's book when I was working on the book. Um, do I miss Will Wright's? That was ice cream. I never got to go. I, I always went to Baskin Robbins, which will be in the very next book on California. Um, any word, word, any word on the original pantry downtown? Uh, it's in the second volume. Um, Candace Castle, will I be covering historical San Diego restaurants anytime soon? No, maybe I might put that together. Uh, those of you know me from San Diego CBS and uh, San Diego Living, I do the morning show down there. Uh, Cindy, um, her question is, are you looking at restaurants beyond Los Angeles city limits smokehouse in Burbank? Um, I accidentally forgot this one in this book and I did go beyond, but I didn't go a lot of restaurants beyond in this book. This book has Tam O'Shanter and uh, because of the Walt Disney aspect, the smokehouse in Burbank, those of you outside of town, uh, the smokehouse is where they filmed La La Land and a lot of other places. So yes, it'll be in it. Um, you are right. Uh, Richard Ross, uh, the opera singers of Michelli's reminds him of Sarno's uh, of Las Vilas, and that is listed. Uh, Michael has Little Joe's in Chinatown, question mark. That was the oldest restaurant from 1897, around in there, and it closed in the 70s, or in the 90s. That is listed um, to be in the next book because I, I did find a lot of information. Um, if any of you have um, old menus of these places that I've mentioned that I don't have in the book, I will be looking for things like that. So. Um, we, we will be uh, working on that. Um, let's see. Yep. 
happened. Celeste just put in the Art Deco Society. Now this, if you live in Los Angeles, even if you don't live in Los Angeles, being part of the Art Deco Society, um, it, it's so fascinating. You get into some buildings you never thought you would. We've been on tops of buildings in Los Angeles from the Art Deco years. And they have um, upcoming events. And they pre-COVID, they have a... Um, uh, dinner, not dinner, that's another event I do, um, cocktails in historical venues around Los Angeles. And people will dress in uh, Art Deco outfits and you don't have to, but they do. And it's um, uh, great because they'll be, um, you'll walk into a place and people will be all dressed up. People say, are they filming a television show around here? And uh, we've we've been to some great, great little places and large places. So um, here's, uh, so make sure uh, the Art Deco Society and just to be on their mailing list is fun. And they tell you what's going on. Any information on Cafe La Mez that was once at 9039 Sunset Boulevard? Um, I'm trying to think offhand, what was at 9039 also? No to the answer of that, but... Uh, that I'll have to look, I'm gonna write that down. So I 90 sunset, cause I know another, it could be one of my restaurants that is in the book. What's the latest on the hot dog stand? Um, uh, Desiree Gonzalez says that she knows a restaurant, restaurant tour briefly owned it. Well, the 1933 group owns it now and uh, Bobby is putting it together. In fact, uh, last week I said, her, he was doing something. I think he was buying an old car or something. And I said, uh, you should be uh, working on um, uh, hot dogs recipes, So, which he was. So that'll be coming up. Is Felipe's open now? Yes, it is. Um, they have partial dining inside. My, I say you should go to Felipe's at 11.30 in the morning or... 2.30 in the afternoon before the lunch rushes and never on a Dodger game day because that is where everyone from the Dodgers goes before or after and never on, um, Sundays are good, but those are the days to do it. What was Frank Sinatra's favorite restaurant? Now, this is crazy because every Italian place claims that Frank Sinatra loved this restaurant in Hoboken, New Jersey. I did a food tour of Hoboken and every place we went, Frank Sinatra's favorite. Uh, so uh, like my Chasen's Chili, I'm not gonna answer it because I don't know, because I didn't talk to Frank and he's not here with us. So, and Tim Miller, uh, you aren't that old. Tim worked at Disney or he still does, but uh, when I was the pastry chef at Disneyland, uh, Richard Ross, um, will I mention Aki dogs, Danny's dogs in the new book? Um, in fact, I think Chris Nichols from the LA Magazine just did a story on that. I, I read it somewhere. Um, it, it, it's interesting. Uh, uh, today, that was on Santa Monica Boulevard. Now it's off of uh, Fairfax. And it looks like a place you would never go eat. And uh, I, I went there many times when it was on Santa Monica. Now the fat burger is at that location, uh, the, the, that address. But um, I don't have it listed in the new book. I might put it in. It, it is a fascinating, uh, it was a, a big uh, punk rock hangout. And uh, it was great because you get, oh, in fact, I'm reading it now, but uh, you, after going out bar hopping, it would be the only place you would eat this. During the day, you probably wouldn't. And it would be uh, two hot dogs wrapped inside a tortilla with pastrami and uh, bacon cheese. And I think it had a little bit of chili in it. And um, it would be wrapped and you would eat this thing like a burrito. And it, it, was, it was good only at two in the morning. Uh, two in the afternoon, I don't think it was that good. Um, it, Richard also mentions Pink's uh, hot dogs uh, adapted the same concept for their burrito dog. And Pink's is in the Made in California book that comes out. And uh, Richard Pink, phenomenal guy. He, uh, if you, ha his parents started Pink's a little hot dog stand. So is Cupid's, which is in the Valley. So that'll be listed. So um, uh, let's see, I think a 
Uh, okay, now we're back down to Scotty. Will you be doing a similar presentation like this one on your upcoming book on California burger eateries, drive-ins? Um, if I'm asked, I'll do anything. Uh, like somebody said, I go to a garage door opening. I'll be there. Um, and uh, Candace is a member of Art Deco of LA, and it's fabulous. And Candace, I hope to see you and come up to me when uh, you see me in maybe a blue suit because I like to wear my blue suit a lot. Um, any thoughts on the closing of Pacific Dining Car? That was one of the last places I ate before COVID. I ate there for uh, Valentine's Day. And um, I was really sad. Uh, the Pacific Dining Car was 99 years old. It, it didn't hit 100. They closed it. Um, I look at these places that after 99 years, you'd think they'd own their property and wouldn't have to pay rent at that point. So it's, it's sad. Um, I, I, I really wish uh, it, they are saying that they, they auctioned everything off. They auctioned even the chairs and the menus and the cash register system, but they have said that it's going to be, uh, they're going to look at stuff online or something, but I, I think it's closed for good because they closed their Santa Monica location first. And um, if uh, anyone would like to know, which you know I, I did mention Golden Girls, but uh, that was um, uh, the last Golden Girl that's still alive, Betty White's favorite restaurant. So, um, so there we go on that. Candace, you're busy. Um, will the Harvey Girls restaurant particular at the LA Union Station be included in the book? I remember eating there when I was about five years old uh, and uh, taking somebody to the train station. Um, you know, it might be. I'm trying to stay with things that are s pretty much Los Angeles area, not chain national. So there we go. Um, Angela says, thank you. Thank you, Angela, for being here. Fritz, um, okay, is just mentioning the Aki Dog is disgusting. Um, Tim Miller, again, wants to know if Atomic Cafe downtown LA will be listed. Uh, Candace is going to say hi to me. Um, Gabriel had their um, graduation dinner at the dining car, losing it hurt. Yeah, it, it, I, I, you know, it, it's just you don't know the reason why things do close. Um, could it be they didn't own the property? Um, you look at Musa and Frank's 101, 102 years old, and they stayed on, but uh, they had backing and they did a, a, a Me Too. And uh, like I was telling um, Larry beforehand, um, when these places were closing and they, uh, when we all were closed for three months completely, 100%, not even takeout, I uh, started buying uh, gift cards. And uh, I have a, an envelope filled with gift cards from the 133 group, um, uh, a number of places. Dining car, I didn't, and you'd lose it. But it was uh, kind of an insurance policy that they came back. You knew that they would come back if you did it. Um, so yeah, Gabriel, I'm with you. Um, Tanya wants to know, will I include El Cholo? And El Cholo is listed in my very next book, Made in California. And uh, Ron, that uh, is the fourth generation uh, owner, uh, was very uh, great in helping me with all the different um, uh, information and pictures. And if you are in the area, go to El Cholo on Western. It's there second location, no, third location. Their first location was downtown LA, a little tiny place. It wasn't called El Cholo. And then uh, they were on Western, then they moved down to where they're at now. So that um, is a, a really a historical time capsule when you walk through there. And I love the places that are like that to where when you're waiting for your table, you'll read all of the pictures and things. So that's what I'll be looking at for my following book. Uh, at uh, places that do have a lot of pictures and history. So uh, did I ever cover automats in any of my books? You know, what's interesting is this Hollywood, I call it the Hollywood book, LA Legendary Restaurant book, um, was my first historical book. The next book does not have any recipes at all. It's just all history. 
And no, I didn't. I didn't add any. Um, uh, Nick Lodell's, and you did spell it incorrectly, which I think I have too. Um, Nick Lodell's uh, got kind of absorbed, closed. The building moved over into the Paramount Studios uh, back lot, um, if that makes sense. They extended the back lot onto Melrose where it wasn't before. But Nick Lodell will be in uh, the second volume. I do have it listed. <coughs> uh, let's see. Mm. A and W root beer, and that's in the next book because it started in Lodi, California. So, and uh, there's a plaque where it was in the cement, and it's now a dog grooming place. So, uh, drive-ins. Um, I don't have a whole lot of drive-ins, but um, I I I hope um, I will in the next, I, uh, you know, there are some books on drive-ins. Uh, California had a lot of drive-ins and um, there's some historical uh, architectural books on drive-ins. Uh, I, it was interesting working on this Made in California book, the drive-in that started a lot was um, uh, McDonald's. It wasn't a drive-in, it was a drive-in to start with. And when they um, and the McDonald brothers owned a, 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 a theater in uh, Glendora area, and they reused the uniforms of the Escherettes into the drive-in kids or the girls. And then they had to stop. They, they found out that the drive-in girls were flirting too much with the guys coming in with their hot rods and stuff. So I talk a lot about that. And Back in 1947, I believe it is, Life Magazine did a whole story and it was fascinating. The, the girls didn't get paid anything. They only got tips and there were rules. So I put that in the next book of the drive-in the girl and what they could or couldn't do. So uh, Scotty, we have, uh, oh, wants to know if I'm gonna do in-person signings. Um, I hope to, I'm sure we're gonna, my, Tim Miller was there. I did a book signing at um, uh, Book Soup uh, Sunset. And in my mind, I thought you made it when you, and that, uh, that book was my 13th book, I think it is. And um, when you go to Book Soup, those of you outside the area, every star has done a book signing there. And I was so excited to be there. And it humbled me when I knew I made it, when I went into the bathroom and I'm standing there doing my business and I see a picture of myself above the urinal saying George Gary is coming to do a book signing here so I knew I made it when I was above the urinal <laughs> at that place so um, hopefully I do and um, autograph copy sometimes I have copies of um, books I've got a number of the Hollywood uh, the the book we're talking about now so you can uh, get on my mailing list so um He's a monster that says line up with which was oh okay. Gabriel um has, has a hypothetical question. Um really he should ask Quentin Tarantino about it, but if he decided to do a sequel on Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, now if any of you were on Hollywood Boulevard while they were filming, I went out there, I ate it. No, I couldn't eat it. Um at uh, Moose and Frank's, they closed it down for a number of weeks, but I was out there and you felt like you were on the Hollywood set and you felt like it, it was so fascinating. I have a lot of pictures of uh, the set dressers that worked out there. But uh, Gabriel wants to know, um, a montage of LA sites lighting up, which locations would I have loved to have seen in the next, uh, in the next uh, movie? Um, hmm. Hamptons Hollywood, that was a, a hamburger joint on, on Hampton, uh, uh, Paul Newman owned part of that. Um, I think, um, well, there was the, the series just called Hollywood that uh, was done and they supposedly, they were filming there but they didn't get it into the series on Netflix, um, the uh, Foster's Freeze. And those are so iconic and those are in made in California book. So, um, uh, yeah, I would do that. Um, that would be one. Then we have, um, 
a, a mention of the California hist no culinary historians of Southern California. I've been a member for years and years and years, and they have excellent lectures online, um, in person at the LA Library. So the culinary historians and they help with the rare book room, um, with uh, and that's another great uh, if you like food. So the history of culinary. So make sure you do that. Um, uh, Sternberger's in Highland Park. Hmm, I've never been there, come to think of it. I don't know if it's still current or not. So um, then we have Jerry's Deli, the, what's the latest? Um, their menus are too big when they were. I don't know. I, I really don't know. Um, uh, Celeste should be my secretary. Uh, good friend, she just popped in with the uh, website for the culinary historians of Southern California in the uh, question and answer. So um, uh, what about the uh, Dimsdale restaurants? I don't know anything. So culinary, the studio commissary recipes you would have liked to have included in any of your books. Studio commissaries are interesting. They're similar to college commissaries as they're and like uh, uh, Disney commissaries. Um, they get uh, sold over to um, the to like Marriott. Um, when I years ago I worked at Marriott hotels and there was a um, uh, oh Biola University and so it's kind of hard with commissaries or cafeterias or school cafeterias to get uh, recipes because it's mostly, and today recipes are really difficult because they use so much prepared product wherever they go. So um, it, it's kind of a, a prepared thing. So, so that's that. I don't have anything on Jerry's Deli, what's going on, um, Desiree. Then Linda uh, Walsh, um, uh, oh yeah, Breakfast in Hollywood. Uh, I've got that listed in the next book to talk about. It was a Breakfast in Hollywood radio broadcast. Um, even um, Hamburger Hamlet, they broadcasted in the evenings after midnight uh, radio shows. So throughout Los Angeles and Hollywood, there was radio programs going on all over the place. So. Anyway, the Windsor was a Dimsdale restaurant. Okay, I'll make note of that. So, oh, okay. You, all right, Tim, see, now I have, he was thinking of the Hollywood heyday, not the current period of time for studio commissary recipes. Hmm. See, I don't know who cooked or made those, but um, I do have some commissary recipe or menus. And uh, if you ever are, looking into uh, recipe, not recipes, um, menu collections um, that tell a big story of, of Los Angeles. LA Library, um, UNLV out of, uh, um, UNLV is Las Vegas. And, the, and these are all online. So uh, Las Vegas, and then the New York Public Library. And the New York Public Library is fascinating because theirs goes back into the 1700s and of recipes. And you uh, can do a search, let's just say you want to know the first time turtle soup was served somewhere on a recipe and it will pop in and tell you and show you the whole um, menu of turtle, uh, where turtle soup first was shown. So it's uh, fascinating. Um, <laughs> okay, Arts Deli, yep. Uh, amazing, they came back after a devastating fire. Um, then uh, Patricia Luell and Taylor the Cock on La Cienega were childhood favorites. Um, they also had Santa on the roof every Christmas. They did. La Cienega was restaurant row that they were all fascinating. The only one really originally left is um, the uh, Lowry's that moved back to their original address location. Lowry's is in the next book uh, because they gave me so much for the Tam O'Shanter, which is part of the family. And I uh, included them in the next, um, the because Lowry's is a chain, uh, kind of. So they have other locations in Asia and stuff. 
All right. Anything about, oh, how do you say that? El Pechye? I don't. Do you know anything about that, Todd? Oh, it's a famous uh, burrito uh, Mexican food place in Oil it's Heights. I need to get into some of those smaller towns and stay out of Hollywood, you know? I'm going to put write that down, but I don't have anything on it right now. Um, I don't know their status right now either, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's the thing, the, the status, the like the Milta Cafe is still going. So um, am I including Apple Pan in the hamburger book? No, because Apple Pan was, I skipped one, I'm sorry. Um, the uh, Apple Pan is not a chain. So, uh, or it didn't become a chain from California. I do have it listed as one for the next, the, uh, the next uh, volume two. I do have it listed there. But, and that depends on how cooperative the owners are in them getting in the book. Uh, you kind of have to, if uh, you don't fight, it's, they think you're gonna write something wrong. And I let them read what they're saying. The, the book we're talking about today does have a little bit of a dirt smut aspect to it. I mean, I do have Patrick Terrell from uh, uh, Mommy's Own Restaurant. I talk about how he would judge the people in their clothing as where if he allowed them into the restaurant. And, um, the, but that was a well-known fact. So I, I do, um, um, I'll do something like that in that book, but I want, I didn't in the chain book I, I took, or, or the Made in the California book, I took pretty much their company story and expanded on it without going into anything of uh, affairs. So, well, let's take in and out Burger, you know, the, a number of the executives and family members were killed in a plane crash. And I wasn't gonna include that in the story. And then when I was talking with their media department, I said, you know, I need to, I do need to put this in, but I'm not going to put in substance abuse that was part of some of the people. I wasn't going to do that. And so I had them read it and they said, you were very tactful in how you put it and we're, we'll okay this. So that's how I put the, uh, but I didn't put anything about the, uh, the other aspect of it. So I kind of wanted to watch how I did it. So, okay. Patricia has a luau menu and a book by McCormick and Schmidt. Hmm. That's a chain. Did they, they didn't start in California. I, I don't, I, I'm, thinking maybe, I don't know, or mm, I'm thinking that you might be thinking of, um, maybe you are, I, I don't know. The McCormick and Schmidt that I know of is um, beef and seafood, not luau-ish. So, all right, uh, Suki G, uh, yep. Okay, it's operated by the original family, famous burritos uh, we're talking about. Um, the Mexican in Boyle Heights. Yep, it is in Los Angeles. Yeah, I, I was speaking of Los Angeles downtown proper and um, uh, even San Pedro's Los Angeles. A lot of people don't even know Long Beach is Los Angeles. So Ports of Call in San Pedro. I don't know, Stephen doesn't have a question or I'm not sure, but uh, um, the Far East Cafe in Little Tokyo, the oldest Chinese restaurant in um, little Tokyo. I do have that listed. Um, Tommy's. Yep. Tommy's is listed in, uh, the Made in California book. So that's where that's listed. That's it for questions and answers that I see. <laughs>